C-SPAN. Online prescription drug sales is the subject of a hearing this morning by the House Government Reform Committee. Government and industry representatives will give their take on whether further regulation is needed. Prior to the hearing, the, uh, the committee will be taking care of committee business. Live coverage here on C-SPAN 2. Good morning. The committee will hold a very brief business meeting before we convene the hearing on the Internet Pharmacy Consumer Protection Act. The committee will consider a committee resolution assigning members to subcommittees as well as a postal designation. The committee resolution has been distributed and without objection it will be considered as read and open for amendment. Last week, the House designated Catherine Harris of Florida and Pat Tebury of Ohio as new members of this committee. Catherine Harris is serving her first term as the representative from the 13th District of Florida, which includes her hometown of Sarasota. Ms. Harris also serves in the Financial Services and International Relations Committee. Prior to coming to Congress, Ms. Harris served in the Florida Senate from 1994 to 1998. Uh, you may also recall uh, Ms. Harris' uh, service as Florida's Secretary of State. In addition to her electoral responsibilities in that position, she served as the head of the Florida Department of State, a multifaceted agency of seven divisions and 700 employees that manage Florida's state-level responsibilities in international affairs, elections, corporate and business registrations, licensing, historic preservation libraries, and culture and the arts. A former IBM marketing executive and vice president of a commercial real estate firm, Congresswoman Harris earned a master's degree from Harvard University with a specialization in international trade and negotiations and a bachelor's degree in history from Agnes Scott College. Pat Tebury, now in his second term, represents Central Ohio's 12th District. Mr. Tebury also serves in the Education Workforce and Financial Services Committees. It was named an assistant Republican whip last year. During his eight years in the Ohio House, from 1993 to 2000, he rose to the position of Majority Leader, the third highest post in the Ohio State House. I welcome you both to the committee. The resolution assigns Mr. Tebury to the Subcommittee on Criminal Justice, Drug Policy and Human Services and the Subcommittee on Energy Policy, Natural Resources and Regulatory Affairs. Ms. Harris is assigned to the Subcommittee on National Security, Emerging Threats and International Relations and the Subcommittee on Government Efficiency and Financial Management. The resolution makes two other changes to the subcommittee rosters. Mr. Schrock is leaving the Criminal Justice Subcommittee and joining the Subcommittee on Energy Policy, Natural Resources and Regulatory Affairs as that panel's vice chairman. Finally, Ms. Watson is leaving the Technology Subcommittee and joining the National Security Subcommittee. Mr. Waxman, do you have any comments on the new subcommittee assignments? I want to uh, welcome our new members to the uh, committee, and uh, I know they'll be a welcome addition. And uh, we're pleased to uh, support this resolution. On our side, uh, Representative Diane Watson is going to uh, go to the Subcommittee on National Security, Emerging Threats, and International Relations. We have uh, uh, a vacancy still on the Democratic side, and when we fill that vacancy, I expect that we'll be filling uh, our remaining subcommittee vacancies as well. But I urge you in supporting the resolution. Thank you very much. Ms. Harris, do you want to make any comments here? Thanks Thank you. for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's, it's certainly an honor and uh, to join a committee that serves as the nerve center for our efforts to promote smart, efficient, and responsive government for America. Far too often our nation becomes ensnared in a debate that recognizes recognizes two extreme options, a suffocating, wasteful, and intrusive government that believes it can solve every problem versus no government involvement whatsoever outside the realm of national security. In the aftermath of September 11th, however, we've discovered that homeland security encompasses many more government functions and simple maintenance of strong military. We learned that functions seemingly limited to economic or social areas, such as preserving the safety of our food and drug supply and ensuring availability and affordability of health care have become just as critical to our security. So today, as we celebrate 150 years of the Republican Party's contributions to the development of our nation's political system this morning, we're tempted to remember President Ronald Reagan's statement that, quote, government is not the solution, government's the problem, end quote. This searing indictment becomes applicable when we do nothing to curb government's wasteful excesses and its ravenous appetite for overregulation. Nevertheless, we must also remember that that progressive heritage of another Republican president, Teddy Roosevelt, who understood that by operating with an appropriate awareness 
of its limitations, government can truly serve the public good. So together, I believe we'll find a bipartisan solution for, for opportunities that curb waste, fraud, and abuse while enabling government to effectively and efficiently promote the general welfare of every American. And I look forward to working with each member of this committee to achieve this essential goal. Thank you again. Ms. Harris, thank you very much. If there is no further discussion, I ask unanimous consent that the committee adopt the resolution. Uh, without objection, so ordered. We also have H.R. 3917 introduced by Congressman Steve Israel of New York. It renames the facility of the U.S. Postal Service located at 695 Marconi Boulevard in Copeg, New York, in honor of the late Suffolk County legislator Maxine S. Postal. Ms. Postal passed away on New Year's Day after battling the rare brain disorder Kurtzfell Jacob disease. Maxine Postal was first elected to the Suffolk County Legislature in 1987, becoming the first woman to represent the 15th Legislative District. She earned recognition for her effectiveness and ability to work on a bipartisan basis. Some of her legislative accomplishments included protecting the environment through recycling, preserving open space, fighting to ease the tax burden, ensuring access to better health care and treatment, and working to revitalize and beautify community centers. Ms. Postal enjoyed tremendous popularity, and her contributions to her Long Island community will have a long-lasting effect. Mr. Waxman, do you have any comments? This, uh, uh, this proposal by Representative Steve Israel is one you have explained. Uh, uh, adequately. Uh, this is a tribute to a very distinguished uh, presiding officer of the Suffolk County Legislature with a distinguished career of public service, and I urge all members to support the resolution. Okay. As, uh, if there is no further statements, I ask unanimous consent that the committee report H.R. 3917 to the full House. Uh, is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. Uh, I want to note that we have the Dominion Christian School from Oakton, Virginia in attendance over here, and I want to welcome you to today's, uh, this is a markup of uh, legislation we've just completed. We're going to take a, about a two-minute recess and then reconvene and hold a hearing uh, on some uh, important legislation. So uh, if there's no uh, further business at this point, the business meeting is adjourned. The hearing will be convened in two minutes, um, and the, so the witnesses can take the table for our hearing.
Mr. Zeus. Good morning. A uh, quorum being present, the Committee on Government Reform will come to order. I'd like to welcome everybody to today's legislative hearing on H.R. 3880, the Internet Pharmacy Consumer Protection Act. This hearing will focus on how to curb, through legislation, the growing sale of prescription drugs over the Internet without a valid prescription. Prescription drugs are well regulated in this country by a system that includes pre-market approval by the FDA, state licensure of health care practitioners who are allowed to prescribe, and state oversight of pharmacists and pharmacies. However, as noted in previous committee hearings and recent media reports, the Internet creates an easy environment for illegitimate pharmacy websites to bypass traditional regulations and establish safeguards for the sale of prescription drugs. I think all of us here today have opened our inboxes to find dozens of emails advertising medications at low cost with no prescriptions required. The risks of this kind of self-medicating can include adverse reactions from inappropriately prescribed medications, dangerous drug interactions, use of counterfeit or tainted products, and addiction to habit-forming substances. Mr. Waxman and I recently introduced H.R. 3880 because too many people are finding ways to obtain medications online without valid subscriptions. And uh, regulating those Internet pharmacies can be a challenge for federal and state enforcement capabilities. H.R. 3880 amends the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act to address this problem in three steps. First, the bill establishes disclosure standards for Internet pharmacies. These websites are required to display certain identifying information, including the name of the business, pharmacist, and physician associated with the website. Second, the bill prohibits Internet sites from selling or dispensing uh, prescription drugs solely on the basis of an online questionnaire. Online medical evaluations don't meet reasonable standards of care and create risks for consumers. And third, the bill provides additional authority for states to take actions against illegal Internet pharmacies. The bill allows states' attorney generals to file an injunction in federal court to shut down a rogue site across the country. The need for legislation is critical, and I say this as someone who is normally more than a little hesitant to regulate the Internet or hinder e-commerce. The illegal diversion and abuse of prescription drugs is becoming an increasingly serious problem in this country. Last March, several of the witnesses who are joining us again today highlighted this problem in their testimony and asked for the help from Congress. Mr. Waxman and I uh, deliberate, gave it deliberate consideration and responded with legislation to help protect consumers and aid federal and state enforcement and regulatory capabilities. As we hold this discussion on the legislation today, it's important to clarify that H.R. 3880 is intended to tackle domestic Internet pharmacies that sell drugs without a valid prescription. The bill is not intended to address international pharmacies that sell drugs at a low cost to consumers who have a valid prescription from their U.S. doctors. Although the debate over reimportation is an important one, it's not the focus of this hearing. I want to thank our uh, ranking member, Henry Waxman, uh, for his efforts and leadership on this legislation and his commitment to public health. I would also like to thank our witnesses for their participation today, and I look forward to their testimony. I'm happy to extend a very specific welcome to my good friend, uh, Jerry Kilgore, who is the Attorney General of my home state of Virginia, who is here today representing the National Association of Attorneys General. Jerry, uh, thanks uh, for being with us. I will now yield to Mr. Waxman for an opening statement. I would like to thank uh, Chairman Davis for holding this hearing today on how to stop domestic websites from selling potentially dangerous medications without a valid prescription. These websites occupy a dark and dangerous corner of the U.S. health care system but they are not hidden. A simple email may entice consumers, even children, to order potentially dangerous drugs prescribed on the basis of a cursory questionnaire by an anonymous physician. In fact, just last night, one of my staff members, in preparing for the hearing today, received an unsolicited email message offering overnight delivery of Viagra. Uh, I have a, a poster over there uh, that uh, uh, points out the website and uh, that the email was linked to. This website offers many potentially dangerous medications, including some controlled substances. The web page, page promises, quote, FDA-approved drugs and states, quote, one of our U.S. licensed physicians will review your request and issue prescriptions for your medication, end quote. I would note that the webpage site does not state 
a physician will determine whether this medication is right for you. It does require that the user enter all credit card and shipping information before any online consultation occurs. The growing number of illegitimate internet pharmacies has alarmed state medical boards, yet states which traditionally have regulated the practice of medicine and pharmacy have been frustrated in their ability to shut these sites down. One problem is that enforcement efforts are complicated. A website operator can be in one state, the pharmacy in a second state, and the prescribing physician in a third state. This may bring three different state standards into play. A second problem is that even when they are successful, states typically can only obtain an injunction that keeps an illegitimate site from selling to residents of that state alone. And a third problem is that some state laws are too vague to allow boards of medicine and pharmacy to quickly crack down on these illegitimate sites. When states cannot solve a national problem, it is essential that the federal government step in. In this case, however, the Department of Health and Human Services has been reluctant to venture into an area traditionally handled by the states, absent clear direction from Congress. It's now time for Congress to provide that clear direction. Last year, this committee held an investigative hearing examining domestic internet pharmacies. At the hearing, individuals representing state and medical pharmacy boards expressed support for legislation that would create a federal definition of valid prescription for the purposes of internet prescribing. The chief of enforcement at the Food and Drug Administration testified that such a standard would assist his agency with shutting down illegitimate sites. And the chairman of the Federal Trade Commission described, such, 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 described a successful model in the Federal Telemarketing Sales Act that permits states to work with the federal government to protect consumers. Since that hearing, we've worked together, Chairman Davis and I, to craft a narrow but effective legislative remedy. Our bill, H.R. 3880, creates a single national standard for valid prescription for internet prescribing by barring websites from arranging prescriptions from doctors who have never seen the patients. It also provides that internet pharmacies make basic disclosures of information to consumers, and it allows state attorneys general to obtain nationwide injunctions against illegal sites, avoiding the need for cumbersome state-by-state -state enforcement. Our philosophy with this bill is that less is more. We have aimed to define the minimum federal standard necessary to accomplish our goal, and we have encouraged enforcement by the states, the traditional regulators of medicine and pharmacy. Our bill does not affect the separate question of reimportation of prescription drugs, and it would not alter the practice of telemedicine. I look forward to hearing from the distinguished witnesses today and to working with Chairman Davis and all the members of this committee to improve this bill as necessary and move it through the Congress. This is a good example of the legislative process at its finest. After hearing from the witnesses in our first uh, t uh, uh, hearing on the matter, uh, we uh, looked at, at what they had to say, we heard what they suggested, and we came up with a proposal. And now today we'll hear reactions to this proposal. Those reactions and the input help us make sure that we're uh, wor working together on a bipartisan basis to make the bill as good as it possibly can be to protect the public interest. And I thank the chairman for setting the tone and working in this way so that we can accomplish something that's important uh, for the American people. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. Any other members wish to make statements? Uh, late, gentlelady from the District of Columbia. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I, I appreciate the way you and uh, Ranking Member Waxman have worked together uh, to uh, try to uh, deal with this uh, relatively new phenomenon. It is also uh, a new phenomenon in our society that prescription drugs are advertised on the media. In fact, some of the advertisements are truly laughable after after uh, trying to entice you to, uh, in this country, I suppose, go to your doctor and, and get a prescription for XYZ drug, then they list all the things it'll do to hurt you, and I guess that's because of regulations of the FDA, and so they become, become fodder for, for, the, for the late night talk shows, and all these miracle drugs are advertised along with all the things that are 
that they could do to harm you so that there will not be liability uh, in case you um, don't understand that these drugs uh, have both good and bad effects. But of course, if you go to your doctor, you're going to find that out and you're going to have a professional that makes that judgment and advises you accordingly. But uh, the internet has opened up a straight line path uh, between uh, the patient and somebody somewhere uh, who in fact will provide this drug uh, that perhaps you have seen on television that you think is exactly what you need to do what you want uh, without any expert in intervention. Um, this, I, I cannot, first of all, it's amazes, it amazes me that this has gone on this long without, uh, without uh, some, some action at, le at the federal level. I understand that states uh, have tried to do something about this, but this, of course, <laughs> cries out for um, Intercommerce Commission, ICC, uh, I mean, a, a for, the, for the Commerce Clause, um, intervention of the federal government. Uh, I am, I, I say that I'm surprised that no catastrophe has, heard, has occurred with people ordering these drugs. I'm sure they have. If they have occurred, I, I can't imagine where the liability would lie or if in fact you could find somebody to sue and sue successfully, especially since this goes on across international boundaries. So this has already gone on much too long. We have no way of knowing, no way of knowing how many, many people have been hurt. We do know this is a very enticing temptation, particularly when the drugs are advertised on legitimate television and you can eliminate some of the difficulties, especially with the cost of health care. Uh, and, and going to a doctor by going straight to one of these websites and perhaps doing yourself great harm. Uh, prescription drugs are the true miracle medicine uh, for today because they do so much good. I think the time has come to make sure we don't besmirch uh, what these drugs can do by allowing this uh, matter to hang out there unattended. And I thank you very much again, Mr. Uh, Chairman, for this hearing. Thank you. Any other statements? If not, we have our first panel. Um, we have Mr. William Hubbard, who uh, is here testifying on behalf of the Food and Drug Administration. Mr. Hubbard is the Associate Commissioner for Policy and Planning. He is accompanied by Mr. John M. Taylor III, the Associate Commissioner for Regulatory Affairs. Mr. Taylor will be available to respond to questions uh, posed by members. It is the policy of this committee. We swear all witnesses before they testify. Would you stand with me and raise your right hand? You solemnly swear the testimony you are about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Mr. Hubbard, your entire statement is a part of the record. Uh, what we would like you to do is try to keep it to five minutes. We have a light in front of you. When it turns orange, it means four minutes are up. And when it turns red, five are up. And try to move to summary because our, our statements are based on your entire uh, uh, testimony. And we welcome you and thank you for being with us. Uh, you too, Mr. Taylor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and as you say, I do have a written testimony. Uh, that I will just make a few brief remarks. We, uh, we thank the committee for holding this hearing. I, we believe you, you are recognizing a significant public health threat from unregulated Internet uh, sites. Uh, the Internet sales of drugs are a wonderful tool for pharmacists and patients and physicians to use, however, when they're, only when they're properly operated and regulated. And, and as you're pointing out, many of these are not. The, um, the, the, the public health threat, we believe, is real when patients unknowingly purchase these drugs uh, from unknown websites. And, and the, the disclosure concept that you have recognized, uh, we believe, is an important one. We, we appreciate that the committee is trying to identify some solutions to this problem, who and where these sites are, whether they are licensed, whether they use uh, one of these dubious questionnaires. The uh, concept of the learned intermediary is clearly very important in, um, in the prescribing of drugs, and these sites often do uh, skirt that. Uh, FDA often monitors the Internet. And one of the sites that we have just noticed very recently I would like to uh, point out to the committee if, if I could um, ask the clerk to bring it up to the uh, chair. This, uh, this site, Madam Chairman, is, is, is quite interesting because I, we believe it is emblematic of some of the things that, that your bill is attempting to do and the committee is recognizing. 
as, as, as uh, speakers on the committee pointed out, many Americans get emails with um, offering to sell prescription drugs. And this particular site, and there's a poster of it over here against the wall, um, offers to sell generic drugs. And it caught our eye because these particular generic drugs or, or alleged generic drugs do not have a generic um, versions. So, so we decided to, to investigate that a bit more. And, and so we did a check on the location of the actual internet site and found that it was in China, uh, uh, in Dandong province, China. So we thought they might be selling Chinese um, uh, counterfeits. So we actually made a purchase. And when the drug arrived, as you'll see on the envelope there, it has a return address of Miami, Florida. Uh, but yet, if the postmark you may notice is uh, Dallas, Texas. Then there's a return address if someone needs to reorder in the package that suggests that the person should contact someone in the country of Belize. And then there's an 800 number which we check. We call the 800 number, and the person there said they were located in the United States. And when we called back a second time, they, um, they said that they were uh, in Belize. Uh, we ordered three drugs, Ambien, a control substance as a sleep aid, uh, Viagra and Lipitor. And we noted on the so-called online questionnaire that we were taking erythromycin. And er er erythromycin is a drug that's contraindicated for uh, Lipitor. So, so here you have a, the kind of situation the committee is pointing out. You've got a so-called questionnaire in which the patient is, uh, has a consultation with some potential physician in another country, and you've got a, a lack of disclosure. And in fact, th this, this site has so many convoluted potential sources that we don't know where it is. And so the disclosure uh, concept that is embodied in your bill, we believe, would address these sorts of issues of sites not being where anyone knows about and, and, um, and allowing people to buy or uh, get a drug that uh, has no true prescription, where there's not really a doctor at the other end that sees the patient, diagnoses the patient, and makes a rational uh, prescription for the patient. So uh, with that, um, I will, um, Mr. Taylor and I would be happy to take questions. Thank you very much. I, I apologized. The uh, Vice President was on the phone. I had to say, but Ms. Harris uh, ably uh, took the chair while I was there. But I apologize for leaving in the middle of your testimony. I did read it last night, though. And I, um, it, let me start the question. Historically, states have been the primary enforcement authority with respect to the practice of medicine and the dispensing of prescription drugs. How do you find that appropriate balance? And of course, the Internet raises a whole uh, new paradigm for us in terms of how you do this, because it's so uh, ubiquitous. And, and many people have pointed out that because the Internet crosses state lines, it's more difficult for states to enforce uh, in these kinds of cases that you've pointed out. The, Congress has given FDA the authority to regulate the practice of medicine in only one case that I'm familiar with. So and FDA itself has been reluctant to uh, step into the regulation of practice of medicine, which has been a state responsibility. Here you're identifying a potential need perhaps to, to take one more step into that with the definition of a valid prescription. And we certainly understand uh, your, your thinking in doing so. Well, both the AMA and the FSMB have guidelines that stipulate an appropriate medical relationship between the patient and physician must exist before a prescription is uh, written and dispensed. AMA and the FSMB define this relationship to include a documented patient evaluation, including medical history and a physical examination. Do you agree uh, these recommendations are also consistent with the language in H.R. 3880? I believe they are, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Taylor, would you agree with that, too? Mr. Taylor, at the hearing last March, you stated that a federal standard for what constitutes valid prescriptions is than it would aid enforcement capabilities. Uh, you still of that opinion? You need to push your button. I'm sorry. I did yeah. acknowledge that. And to put it in context, I think what I said last year is a part of the complementary enforcement rule, the states and federal government, we were often reliant upon the state uh, medical boards or the boards of pharmacy to inform us what the proper standard of, of medical care is within a particular state. And so when we're building a case um, and there are differences from some state to state, that raises some challenges, absolutely. Um, FDA uh, is indicated in your testimony has the legal authority to take action against the sale of dispensing a prescription drug without a valid prescription. How often has the FDA used this authority to take action against rogue internet pharmacy sites? 
Well, I can, I can give you an example, a recent example. Um, yesterday, we um, um, announced that we had, um, had uh, brought indictment against uh, an Internet pharmacy site where, indeed, um, one of the charges was the fact that um, the product was being dispensed in a, in a manner that was outside the proper standard of care and standard of, of medical care and the standard of pharmacy in that particular state. It's often um, an element of our criminal cases. What we will do is we'll consult with the states, figure out what the standard is within that state, and make that one of the charges. And what we've seen in many cases, um, especially two recent criminal cases, is that there often have been attempts by those who um, have been indicted to either hide the identity of those physicians that are supposed to be giving proper care or misrepresent the fact that they are licensed within a state when in actuality they are not. So it's often a component of the cases that we bring. And, and Mr. Chairman, while we can do so in some states that have explicit laws, there are many, many states, in fact, a majority of states where the state law does not explicitly define it in a way that FDA can use its authority. Okay. Mr. Taylor, also in, in March uh, hearing, you, you, you noted that you couldn't name a single state that qualifies the use of an online questionnaire as a legitimate or appropriate medical relationship. Do you agree that online medical questionnaires don't constitute an adequate or appropriate medical relationship? Well, let me, let me um, refine that answer. I'm aware of approximately 27 states that generally disallow Internet prescribing. Um, I think seven of those states do so by explicit statute. Um, I think 12 do so based on medical board policy, and another eight do based on medical board rulings. There are another um, 13 states that have chosen to make a determination that Internet prescribing is um, impermissible. So now there are approximately 40 states that have taken a position through some means as to what constitutes proper Internet prescribing, and an online questionnaire falls outside of that, uh, out that side of that arena. I mean, Mr. Chairman, one of the things that's changed in the five years that we've been dealing with the Internet is the fact that both on the federal government level and on the state government level, um, our statutes did not, quite frankly, did not contemplate this type of practice. No. And as time has gone by, the states have um, taken steps to address it expressly through their medical boards and through their boards of pharmacy. And that's why today we have 40 states that have taken some stance. And that has obviously enhanced our enforcement level, our enforcement efforts on the federal level, too. So things have changed a little bit since last year. Well, AMA's testimony today highlights the need for something to be done at the federal level to address the myriad of problems associated with the illegal, illegal use of Internet uh, pharmacies. Do, do you agree with them? Well, I mean, uh, traditionally the, the regulation of uh, or what constitutes a proper um, a medical standard, what constitutes a proper or a valid prescription is something that's resided at the state level. And so I think to the extent that there's going to be any change in that position, that it needs to be done very carefully. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Waxman. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Hubbard, in your written uh, testimony today, you expressed the FDA's concern about the proliferation of sites that substitute a simple online questionnaire for a face-to-face -face examination and patient supervision by a health care practitioner. Uh, let's assume for the moment that some of these websites employ licensed physicians uh, uh, to write the prescription on the basis of the questionnaire. When assessing whether these prescriptions are valid, does FDA rely on a uh, single federal definition or defer to the states? We defer to the states, uh, Mr. And all, are all state definitions alike? No, they are not, Mr. Waxman. Uh, do the varying definitions complicate enforcement actions? Uh, no question. Okay. Uh, H.R. 3880 would solve this problem by creating a single national standard for what is a valid prescription related to Internet pharmacies. We're going to hear from the Virginia State Attorney General on behalf of the National Association of Attorneys General and uh, the Federation of State Medical Boards and the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy are going to endorse such a standard. Why do you think these key state organizations support having a single federal standard for valid prescription related to Internet prescribing? 
when the internet emerged as a tool of this nature, uh, drug prescribing became obvious at that time. And I, I believe the states thought that they could, using their existing authority over physicians and pharmacies, appropriately regulate these businesses. They, they realized fairly quickly, I think by the year 2000, that because these sites would be located in one state but the patient in another, that they were unable to do so. And that you needed, in their view, I believe, and they will express that for themselves, as I understand it, they, they expressed the view that you needed some sort of a more uniform national standard, and, and I believe that they are supportive of that today. Mm -hmm. And so it, it seems that a single national standard is needed to address these rogue websites. That is certainly their opinion. Yeah. Uh, well, our legislation provides this standard while maintaining a key enforcement role for the states, as you, as you well know. Thank you very much for your testimony, uh, both of you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chase. All right, let me ask, uh, let me just go down. Any other questions on this side? Yes, sir, a gentleman from Tennessee. Um, Mr. Hubbard, uh, as the chairman uh, pointed out in his first question, the primary enforcement role is, uh, for prescribing uh, drugs is up to the states. Uh, but, uh, of course, it's, uh, uh, it, the Internet does not recognize state lines or moves across state lines, and so it's a difficult thing for states uh, to enforce this totally. Uh, but uh, um, I'm just uh, curious, how, how fast are these uh, Internet uh, prescriptions growing. Do we have any estimate of that? Uh, all the articles you read, they say it's growing very fast, but I just wondered if you have any statistics that how many prescriptions are being issued over the Internet now? Well, there are no, um, no, a cert there's no certain certitude here. There are clearly estimates made by various groups. I think the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy have recognized at least 200. Uh, there are many more uh, foreign sites. W we did a, a computer search just last week uh, for one particular set from one country, and this is the list. Um, there's well over a thousand here, and that's just from one locality. That's so a, worldwide, that's a, there may be. Is, is that a thousand? That's a thousand different websites oh, offering to sell drugs in the kinds of ways that the committee is uh, recognizing. Oh, okay. And uh, uh, do you know of instances where children have been getting these uh, drugs over the internet? Uh, have you heard about that? Well, certainly there are drugs that, that, that children use being prescribed. There's a wide, wide range of drugs being prescribed. Some sites limit themselves to just a few lifestyle drugs like Viagra, but, but many sites sell a list of hundreds of different drugs. Have you been getting uh, reports of, of people who have uh, um, been injured or been hurt or made sick uh, or uh, have been ripped off by these uh, prescriptions? We do have reports. Unfortunately, they are relatively sporadic. They depend on a patient who's injured reporting to us. There's, there's, no, there's no good system for tracking some of these drugs that are sold illegally because the, 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 med the medical system is, is designed to track systems that are properly prescribed and dispensed by licensed pharmacies in the United States. And, sir, can I add to that? Well, I know it's difficult, but have you had uh, 100 instances or 1,000 or I, I, cannot, I can't give you a number, but I can give you a tangible example. Last, last summer, we, um, the, and the agency is continuing to investigate this, but last summer we had to um, assist in the recalling of over 200,000 bottles of Lipitor because we discovered that it had been counterfeit. And uh, obviously the, the benefit of... Where was of, that? What? I'm sorry? Where was that? You recall? You, you um, it actually, by the time the recall was finished, um, the counterfeit Lipitor had, had spread throughout the country. And... Um, in some cases, it was available through a brick and mortar pharmacy, but in other cases, it was available over the internet. And the reason I use it as an example is because obviously the benefit of Libertor is its cholesterol lowering properties. Was and that one of the counterfeit Libertor being sold by one internet site or, or many? Or I, it's not clear how many sites it was sold over, but we did get consumer complaints um, suggesting that it was at least sold over two. Um, what happened is that when we put out the original talk paper warning the public about the fact that we discovered this this product, we began to get reports from people, and, and a couple of people reported purchasing over the internet. So I don't know how many internet sites it was available at, but that's a, that's a tangible situation where someone was purchasing a product thinking they were getting cholesterol-lowering properties, and because of the nature of the product, um, not only were they not necessarily getting the, the um, cholesterol-lowering properties, you could argue that indeed they were being ripped off because they were paying for something that they didn't actually get. 
Let me give you an example, Mr. Duncan. Yes. I've got one site here that, that uh, there are 400 different websites. That when we check them, they're all the same business. The same individual runs them and from a small New England town, hmm. but they all have different names and they're targeted at, at, at citizens in different countries, Houston, Phoenix, wherever. So the citizen thinks that's a local business in his hometown selling legal American drugs. In fact, it's one business in New England saying 400 times in 400 cities, we're legitimate, we're legal, and we'll give you a drug if you'll fill out a questionnaire. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Ms. Watson, any questions? I'm uh, waiting on a copy of the bill, Mr. Chairman, but uh, in the bill, this is a question to the chair, uh, does it require a legitimate uh, prescription from the doctor and how is that checked out? You know, you, you send this, if there's a requirement by the um, company, you send that in. How do they check it out to be sure it's valid? Well, a, a, a valid prescription is required to exist, but we, the, the, we go further and define an adequate medical relationship so that the person who is prescribing it has done an appropriate uh, examination and taken the history and has had a meeting with the person as opposed to calling up and a doctor just writing a prescription because you're willing to pay money. That's what's critical in this case. A lot of these areas have people that will sign prescriptions, but they know nothing about the people who are taking the drugs, what they're interacting with, and that's where the danger occurs. Uh, let me ask Mr. Hubbard. Uh, certainly, uh, each state differs from the other. What would be the standard provisions that you would like to see in a piece of legislation that would be able to monitor the abuse of the Internet uh, prescriptions? Well, as Chairman Davis said, FDA has a requirement that there be a valid prescription. That's yes. in federal law. But then FDA relies upon each state to determine whether a given prescription in that state is valid. Who's the and, watchdog? Well, in, in the case of the prescriptions, it's actually the state uh, medical boards and pharmacy boards, not the FDA. Federal okay. law does have a requirement that there be a valid prescription, but each state then determines what that is. Uh, question to the chair. I haven't read the legislation yet, but is there a requirement that each state uh, indicate who the watchdog agency mm -hmm. is and what they watch for? I believe it's very clear, uh, Ms. Watson, that, e that the state pharmacy and medical boards have that responsibility. They accept that responsibility. But yeah. what they're saying is that they can't utilize their law if the website is in another state because they can't prosecute across state lines. So how do we at the federal level uh, get to that issue? That's the crux of the question, and maybe this is to well, the author. Uh, I mean, uh, what happens in this case is we define an appropriate medical relationship. That's where this stuff goes afoul. Uh, you, they can produce a doctor's uh, pres uh, uh, note on this, a doctor's prescription, but there's no relationship. The doc it's like almost like a, uh, uh, an, an auto pen. Uh, there is no appropriate medical relationship in this. We define the appropriate medical relationship. Then it would be up for the state in their enforcement actions to go there, and the burden would be uh, to, to, uh, you know, on, on the people who are dispensing this to prove they had the relationship, which, of course, they don't in many of these cases. Who oversees that, the FDA? Well, I are mean, they, are the state attorney general? I mean, would ha just to give you an example, I mean, there have certainly been instances where more than one state has recognized behavior that they've deemed to be problematic. And what the agency has done is work with what, it, what the states have been able to do is bring some type of action that is confined to their state boundaries. But, but what we've also tried to do is work closely with them so that we could, we, the federal government, could bring a case that is more global in nature and is complementary to the case that the state is bringing so that there's a more comprehensive approach to dealing with problematic conduct that might be going beyond state lines. So there is a way to do it. Right. What triggers well, let me, that? Let me, let me try to help here. Our okay. bill allows the new enforcement authority is, is that we give in this case is modeled on the Federal Telecommunic Telemarketing Sales Act. 
So we have a, an appropriate Federal model on this. Uh, and that allows the State Attorney General to shut down a rogue site uh, across the country rather than only bar sales to customers or consumers in his or her State. If uh, the Internet uh, shows a location down in Central America for uh, controlled drugs, how do, who then is in, I see somebody shaking their head, who then is in charge of overseeing that on the Internet? Well, for the, for the, for controlled substances, the Drug Enforcement Administration has primary um, jurisdiction over controlled substances. However, um, the FDA and the states will often work again with DEA um, to help bring cases if we determine that those products that are being marketed through the website that's listed in Central America are actually making their way well, to the United may States. May I ask who determines that? How is it triggered? Usually, How does the process well, start? Well, usually it's triggered because of the, based on the working relationships that we've established over the years. I mean, we've been at this for about four or five years. We recognized fairly early on that none of us, quite frankly, had either the resources or the expertise to do it ourselves. And so over the last four or five years, um, we've tried to work closely with both our federal and state partners so that we could work together on a real-time basis to address these situations when they come to our attention. So it's really through our, our partnerships and working relationships, and over time they've proved to be quite successful. Thank you. So that's really, really how it's done. Thank you. Time has expired. Thank you very much. Uh, gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Chase. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, thank you and Mr. Waxman for uh, highlighting this issue. Thank you for having this hearing. Thank you for coming forward with legislation that we can consider. I. Um, <laughs> In my earlier life, I used to chair the subcommittee of this full committee that oversaw FDA, and I appreciate so much what FDA has to contend with. Um, at the same time, um, I, I do have some issues that I want to ask. We talk about the questionnaire that has to be filled out for the website. I sent a questionnaire to my constituents, and I had uh, one where I gave a statement, and I said, strongly agree. Some would agree, no opinion, some would disagree, strongly disagree. This was the statement. Americans should be able to import less costly FDA-approved prescription drugs from Canada. I had an intuitive sense that they would probably agree. 62.7% strongly agree, 20.4% agree, 83.1% of my constituents believe that they should be able to import less costly FDA-approved prescription drugs from Canada. Does that statistic surprise you? Not at all. Okay. Uh, the issue is that's illegal right now? Absolutely. Uh, constituents are doing it, correct? Absolutely. Um, I'm told the drug companies have basically exported to Canada or allowed to come into Canada basically seven times what Canada consumes, uh, and it's a growing market. How would you begin to even rein in uh, this illegal uh, activity in Canada? Um, not that I even know if I want you to, frankly. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm having to deal with it, but how would you do it? What, well, we what? cannot under current law. The, the current law was established for FDA to inspect a very large volume of an imported drug, say okay. millions of pills that, uh, that Pfizer might bring in from a plant in Ireland. And, and that process worked very well. But when individuals buy these small, you know, 60 or 90 day supplies, and it comes in in huge quantities to the uh, mail facilities in this country, neither the Postal Service, nor Customs, nor the DEA, nor FDA can, can in any rational way review, look at all those products and make any good judgments about well, whether they're good or not. Who's breaking the law? Is Canada breaking the law and exporting them, or are my constituents breaking the law when there, they buy them? There may be violations of Canadian law, but that would be for them to determine uh, the drugs themselves are clearly illegal. FDA, though, has never taken enforcement action against no, I, individual but, no, but patients. Listen to my question. My, my question is who's breaking the law in the United States? On some technical level, you could argue that the patient is breaking the law by buying those drugs, but FDA has never attempted to punish a okay. patient for and buying so, drugs. So the reality is whatever we do, we still have that issue out there. The importation issue, is, as the chairman so, said at so, the outset, will still be there. So we're going to we, – we, and we, we need to bring some senses both – here and overseas, but what I'm wrestling with is um, I happen to believe that people should be able to import drugs if they're FDA approved. And what I also wonder about is these aren't drugs necessarily made in the United States, then sent to Canada. They're sometimes made elsewhere and sent to Canada just as they'd be sent to the United States. Tell me the logic of why uh, my constituents shouldn't be allowed to buy the same drug, uh, and if they can buy it overseas for less, why they shouldn't be able to. 
because, Mr. Shays, the assumption people make that those drugs are all U.S.-made, high-quality drugs just coming back is wrong in our view. Does it matter if it's U.S.-made? But they make an assumption that drugs they buy here are U.S.-made, and they aren't. So I don't get your point. If you buy a drug here, it's, it's been made in an FDA-inspected facility under very strict FDA manufacturing controls. These foreign drugs, in many cases, do not meet those criteria. So that's the problem. The patient can't make a determination as whether they're getting that U.S. made drug you described do, do, do or that you, other drug. Do you know for, I've, I mean, do we have statistics that tell us that, that the drugs that are buying from Canada are mostly not FDA approved? Mr. Taylor can describe a process of screening these shipments. Uh, he's done two of those recently that found that the vast, vast majority of these actual shipments from Canada are not FDA approved drugs. Okay. So what's, just tell me the statistics. I don't need to know the process. Sir, I'm not sure we have good statistics. I mean, we've, we've tried to determine the percentage as of others. The, the bottom line, though, is that we do believe that um, as demand here increases, or at least our fear is that as demand here in the United States increases, that the Canadian pharmacies that we now see will get their product from sources that are less reputable than the no, sources. But just you're not listening sure. to my question. My question is, do you have statistics that say that the vast majority of the drugs, you're saying it, but you're not giving We have it with sampling statistics, yes. Okay, we can give what is that. the statistic? That 90%, 50%, 20%, 80%, what is it? Well, certainly over 90. Wait, wait, well, wait, 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 no, wait. The, the, what the Blitz showed was that 70 to 90% of the products that were being imported were unapproved. We do not have data. Unapproved, that, yeah. mean, unapproved means not FDA approved. It, yes. Correct. But we do not have data that, that, that okay. but we do not have data um, that, that tells us how much of the product is manufactured in Canada versus manufactured in England versus manufactured in, in, in okay. Asia. Let me, let me just finish this by just making a comment. I know my light's here. This is hugely important that uh, people buy drugs, actually need the drugs they buy, and have been shown by a medical professional to need them. My only point is that we're saying this isn't illegal, this is illegal from the United States, but we're not enforcing it, uh, and you have ambivalence in Congress on this law. This is a huge, gigantic issue that's just only going to get bigger, not, and um, with all due respect to, to your work, we don't have statistics. We're making claims that we can't back up with statistics. Yeah. Can I, may I respond, sir? Sure. Um, we do not have statistics, but we certainly have tangible information. For example, your first question relating to what you should tell your constituents or why your constituents should be concerned about purchasing products over the Internet. Three weeks ago, um, and I know this isn't about the... Can the I tell you this? I, I don't want to keep... Ta my red light's out, but your bottom line is you don't have statistics right now. If I have a second round, I'd be happy to get well, more into this. All right. L let me just note again. I mean, I, this is an important issue, but... The bill really tackles domestic internet pharmacies. We don't really go after the other. And it's, well, that's well, that's right. My point was that someone purchased um, contraceptive patches over an internet site that she thought was a United States internet site. In actuality, she received contraceptive patches that had no active ingredient in them. And by the time that we completed, um, and we're not done with our criminal investigation yet, but by the time we complete that investigation, sir, the origin of those patches turned out to be India. And we had to, we had to actually track through about five or six different sites to determine the origin of the product. And so my only point is that the reason why people need to be concerned is that even though it appears that you're getting an FDA-approved product, we do have tangible examples of where people have not received what they wished or hoped that they had purchased. And it was a consumer complaint by this particular consumer that led us to the discovery. And what we were, did is we warned consumers to be aware of other products purchased on these sites. We were not saying that all sites were bad, but we had tangible proof that these were a set of problematic sites, and we warned the public that they needed to be careful and talk and consult with their health care practitioner when making a decision whether or not to purchase over, over some of these sites. Thank you. Let me just ask if any other members have questions for this panel. Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, I also compliment you and Mr. Waxman for moving forward in this important legislation. This is um, rather urgent because it is such a major issue with regard to uh, abuse and use of uh, the system for doing this. I want to ask a couple things. First of all, the physicians who are involved with prescribing these drugs at the other end of the website, and in some cases they may not be physicians at all, and uh, in some cases uh, from other states or other countries, 
They're not open to any liability at all if they misprescribe, if they do not take an accurate history, if they they're not open to any liability. Am I correct on that? Well, the next panel may be a better uh, set to ask that question, but certainly we, we've pointed out that, that liability concerns must exist here in these cases because you've got people doing things that are either outside the law or, or not proper medical practice. And, and, sir, if we can determine that those physicians are part of a criminal conspiracy, because in some cases the physicians have an agreement with the Internet pharmacy that's supplying these products, we do include them as part of the defendants in our criminal cases. Okay. So they do incur some criminal liability. Uh, another question I have with regard to FDA, is there any requirement for pharmaceutical manufacturers to only sell <clears throat> uh, prescription medication to legitimate distributors who will ascribe to some sort of other laws or code of ethics with regard to how those medications will then be distributed? Well, in fact, we've been working with the uh, wholesalers and, and distributors and manufacturers uh, this year to uh, set up standards by which wholesalers will, will assure <coughs> uh, and manufacturers can assure that they are selling to legitimate wholesalers and that, and that questions, the proper questions get asked about where the drug came from. There are some instances in which wholesalers will buy from uh, somewhat fly-by-night sellers of drugs uh, who offer a deep discount, and that is a way for counterfeit drugs to get into the system. Uh, there's something I want to... Uh, bring to the uh, committee's attention too, and another important aspect of this, and that has to do with even when a physician has face-to-face -face contact with a patient, and particularly the elderly, there was a recent uh, CDC study in the National Ambulatory, Care, Ambulatory Medical Care Survey uh, did a study in which they reported that at least one drug considered inappropriate by experts was prescribed at 7.8 percent of elderly patient visits, that's some 16 million visits a year. At least one drug classified as never or rarely appropriate was prescribed nearly 4 percent of the time. There's a massive amount of medical medication errors that occur even when a physician is face to face with an elderly patient. When I look at the charts here of what is available online, uh, particularly some of the anti-depression uh, pain relief drugs that may have side effects uh, uh, such as dizziness, et cetera. Nothing is more fearful to an elderly person than falling down, uh, having a hip injury, being hospitalized, and having subsequent uh, problems with that. I cannot possibly imagine a scenario by which someone would be uh, um, self-prescribing these things in any sort of a, a way that's actually good for their health. And I understand situations in which a patient has seen a physician and has received a prescription from a physician, a legitimate physician in their area. But I do worry about people self-prescribing because, and, and that is a huge concern. Relatives may say, let's help mom or let's help grandma. Uh, here is something that we know helps someone else. Let's pursue that. Uh, the, the consequences can be extremely harmful and deadly. Some one in eight emergency room visits in this country are medication errors. One in 12 hospital admi uh, admissions are related to medication errors. And those are when patients have seen physicians. So moving forward on legislation such as this is extremely important. However, uh, under circumstances where a person has seen a physician, it's helpful. But under circumstances where someone is still trying to self-prescribe or obtain drugs in unscrupulous manners and use that, I'm very, very worried that there's n almost nothing we can do to prevent that. Am I correct? You're absolutely correct, Mr. Murphy. Someone could, could say on one of these questionnaires, I have hypertension, high blood pressure, when in fact they have hypotension, low blood pressure, and they could order the, exactly the wrong drug because the patient is, is making that decision without the doctor's involvement because we don't believe in many cases there is a doctor at the other end, and they certainly don't seem to be asking the right questions to the patient, and they're certainly not meeting and seeing the patient and checking their blood pressure and all that. So, so you're absolutely right. It, this is a problem that needs to be fixed. On these, uh, do they know the other medication the patient may be on? It, it purports to ask some of those questions. But, but they may example, not know them all because patients themselves may not know. When one of the things we did here, we, we ordered a drug that is contraindicated to be taken with a different drug called erythromycin. Mm -hmm. And so we said that on the questionnaire. We said, I'm taking erythromycin, and we ordered Lipitor. They sent the Lipitor anyway. So it appears they didn't even bother to read the questionnaire. Mm -hmm. it, it, it appears in some cases these questionnaires are, are merely there for, as a facade anyway. And, and just to add to that, I think we need to keep in mind there are also different types of questionnaires. There are some questionnaires that are basically all filled in for you. All you have to do is insert your name and your address, and that's it. There are other questionnaires that ostensibly um, pretend to get all the relevant information, but at the, at the end of the day, as you noted, because there isn't really the proper healthcare care um, practitioner-patient interaction, 
you're absolutely right that there might be critical information that should be gleaned from the patient that is not done so, and that hits the patient and potentially at harm. Well, my hope is we continue on these hearings and move forward with this legislation that Americans will pay attention to the idea that seeing a physician face to face <clears throat> has some room for medication error there alone. Self prescribing and going to sites that are illegitimate is downright dangerous and deadly. And people have to avoid those sorts of sites because that is something that's going to end up killing and harming a lot of Americans. Thank we you, agree, Mr. Mr. Murphy. <clears throat> Thank you. Are there any other members? Uh, Mr. Carter, any questions? No other questions? I don't have any others. Mr. Chase, do you want to ask any follow-up? A question. Sure. If, if someone is sent a drug that um, they didn't have a prescription for uh, and they were to be Ill, become ill or to die, could the pharmaceutical or the Internet organization be found guilty? You can find them. Well, I think you're talking about a tort liability question that uh, we certainly have raised those questions in the case of some uh, businesses that are promoting these. It's not really an FDA question, but one would assume that there would be some liability there. You know, I, I'm struck by the fact that this is so stunning that, that, that I didn't know, I mean, not that many of us didn't know, but I'm stunned that I don't know that you could get something without having some kind of prescription. Uh, and it tells me, frankly, that you all have a responsibility as well. The mere fact that I ask you a question about that issue, it would seem to me that FDA needs to be, a, be much more proactive. And they're going to have to, I think, sort out, uh, it, rather than saying, you know, um, what's happening in Canada is illegal, but it's still going to continue. Um, I happen to want to make it legal. I don't like people breaking the law, but I want to make it legal in a way that works. But I want to do what the chairman wants to do, and I just appreciate that he's made this an issue that we need to be more aware of. But I'm saying as well, I think you all have a responsibility to be a lot more proactive on this. Okay. Fair enough, yeah. sir. We hear you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, let me thank this panel very uh, much. We appreciate your questions. Obviously, we get you up here, we're going to ask you a lot of things that uh, uh, members have questions about, but that's not new to you. You've been dealing with that's this every right. day. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate uh, the, the, your insights on the bill. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to move to our uh, second panel. Um, we have Dr. Jim Thompson of the Federation of State Medical Boards, Dr. Carmen Catazone of the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy, uh, Virginia Attorney General Jerry Kilgore, Dr. Rebecca, uh, Rebecca Patchen of the American Medical Association, and representing the National Community Pharmacists Association, Mr. John Rector. Uh, we may have votes. Uh, we could try to get through everybody's testimony. We may have votes and have to take a brief recess in between. I hope everybody's time we can accommodate that. But um, I will swear everybody in and we'll start the uh, testimony and get as much as far as we can before we have uh, votes. Would you please rise with me and raise your right hand? So I'm swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Dr. Thompson, we'll start with you and we'll move uh, straight down. We got everybody's degrees up there. Uh, Jerry, we didn't put your degree up there, but you're a JD, right? I mean, we, you know, lawyers have doctors now, too. They're doctors That's of right. jurisprudence, and right. we, don't, we don't put it on our letterhead or anything, but uh, <laughs> just trying thank, to, thank trying you, to move Chairman. up and respect with the profession. Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks for being with us. Thank you, and, and good morning and, uh, to members of the committee. I'm uh, Dr. James Thompson. I'm President and CEO of the Federation of State Medical Boards of the United States. The Federation is a national, nonprofit association established in 1912, which serves as a collective voice for its 70 member state medical licensing and disciplinary boards. The Federation's primary mission is to improve the quality, safety, and integrity of health care by promoting high standards for physician licensure and practice as well as supporting and assisting state medical boards and the protection of the public. As I indicated at the hearing this committee held in March 2003, the Federation has been actively involved as a national leader in the use of telecommunications and the Internet in the practice of medicine for a number of years. In 1996, the Federation published a model act to regulate the practice of medicine across state lines. In 2000, it published guidelines for Internet prescribing in 2002, it published model guidelines for the appropriate use of the Internet in medical practice, one of the first national standards established for Internet medical practice. 
Those guidelines which the Federation recommends be adopted by state medical boards include a key provision, and I'll quote from that provision, a documented patient evaluation, including history and physical evaluation, adequate to establish diagnoses and identify underlying conditions and or contraindications to the treatment recommended and provided, must be obtained prior to providing treatment, including issuing prescriptions electronically or otherwise. This has been the key interest of the Federation with respect to Internet pharmacies. There must be an appropriate relationship between the patient and the physician before a prescription is written and medication dispensed. In addition to issuing these guidelines, the Federation has aggressively sought to identify Internet pharmacies that are dispensing drugs on the basis of prescriptions written by health care providers whose relationship with the patient does not appear to meet minimal standards. In September 2000, the Federation of State Medical Boards established the National Clearinghouse on Internet Prescribing to collect and disseminate information on rogue Internet sites offering prescribing and dispensing services for prescription drugs to consumers. The Clearinghouse is uniquely qualified to coordinate information between regulatory and enforcement entities because of its formal relationship with all of the state medical boards in the United States and its territories, and its well-established lines of communication with state and federal regulatory agencies, including the Department of Justice, the Drug Enforcement Agency, the Food and Drug Administration, and the Federal Trade Commission, as well as the National Association of Boards of Pharmacies, the National Association of Drug Diversion Investigators, and the National Association of Attorneys General, representatives of the pharmaceutical industry, and the media. To date, approximately 12 physicians have been the subject of disciplinary actions based on Clearinghouse supplied information. The Clearinghouse has supplied information for more than 127 cases at the federal level and more than 200 cases on the state level. Additionally, information regarding Internet prescribing has been shared with the Medical Council of New Zealand and the Ministry of Health in Germany. The Federation strongly supports state-based regulation of the practice of medicine. With regard to Internet prescribing, however, state medical boards have the authority to discipline licensed physicians prescribing and dispensing medications inappropriately. Several boards have already taken action against licensees, adopted rules or policies, or introduced legislation to clarify this authority. In addition, state medical boards are communicating among themselves regarding physicians licensed in more than one state. These cooperative efforts have been effective in closing several Internet sites and causing a number of physicians to cease their affiliation with questionable operations. That said, I also indicated in my testimony last March that there were at least three issues that needed to be addressed through federal legislation in order to protect patients ordering prescriptions over the Internet. I'm very pleased that H.R. 3880, the Internet Pharmacy Consumer Protection Act, addresses each of those issues. First, I remarked that patients should know with whom they are dealing. They should know the name and location of the pharmacy that is dispensing the drug and the name of the, the physician who will be providing a medical consultation that will be the basis of that prescription. I noted that almost without exception, a state would find that such physician had violated practice standards if he or she wrote a prescription on the basis of an online questionnaire without having any pre-existing relationship with the patient. Therefore, disclosure will not only be beneficial to patients, but will allow state <coughs> medical boards to identify individuals against whom they can take disciplinary action. H.R. 3880 specifically addresses the issue of disclosure by amending the Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act with the addition of a new section. Second, I stated that state attorneys general were not able to enjoin operations of an Internet pharmacy that affects citizens in their particular states if that pharmacy is operated out of another state. Many of our member boards have indicated that they believe that a number of Internet sites that dispense drugs uh, in an appropriate manner could be shut down if the attorneys general had nationwide injunctive powers as well as the ability to pursue other civil remedies including damages, restitution, or other compensation across state lines. Third, I noted that while state medical boards have the authority to discipline physicians who are prescribing and dispensing drugs over the Internet inappropriately, and that many boards had taken such action, state medical boards cannot take action against operators of Internet sites that dispense drugs. I also remarked that while state medical boards believe that the law and regulations governing the physicians in their state are clear 
as to what constitutes an appropriate <laughs> physician-patient relationship for purposes of writing a prescription. Some courts and prosecutors believed that certain state laws and regulations were ambiguous in this regard. I noted that because of that ambiguity, prosecutors had not pursued certain legal actions. Last, I offered to work with, with the committee in trying to craft language that would define an appropriate physician-patient relationship for purposes of regulating Internet pharmacies while preserving the rights and responsibilities of state medical boards. The language in 3880, adding a new section to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, strikes a reasonable balance in requiring for the narrow purpose of regulating Internet pharmacies while regulating the exclusive role of state medical boards in defining that relationship under other circumstances. In conclusion, H.R. 3880 satisfactorily addresses the issues that were raised last year by the Federation of State Medical Boards, and we believe that its enactment into law will provide significant protection for consumers who use the Internet to obtain pharmaceuticals. I thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Cartizan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, committee members, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. The National Association of Boards of Pharmacy, who I represent, its members are all of the licensing jurisdictions in the U.S., Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Australia, and South Africa. The VIPS program is an integral component of the services we provide to the states to help them regulate the Internet and protect the public health. Almost one year to the day, we appeared before this committee to report on the activities of the Internet sites offering prescription drugs for sale. Since that time, much has changed and much has remained the same. Domestic, legitimate Internet pharmacies continue to provide valuable and innovative services to their patients. Although not the focus of the proposed legislation, as Chairman Davis indicated, illegal foreign importation represents a significant threat to state regulation and is an issue that should be addressed. Rogue or illegal Internet sites distributing prescription drugs without a prescription and based in the U.S., although a concern, can be identified and following appropriate due process forced to cease operations. The limiting factor for the states is our resources and nationwide injunctive relief. The required posting of information by Internet sites outlined by H.R. 3880 is an important component of identifying and eliminating rogue and illegal sites. However, NABP is concerned that simply mandating the posting without any credible verification of that information could mislead consumers into believing that illegal or rogue sites are operating legitimately. The required posting will also not address foreign sites, which pose the biggest problem for state and federal regulators. Some of the examples given today by Mr. Hubbard and others indicate the steps which these rogue or illegal operators will take to confuse the public and hide information. The simple posting of information without verification does not address this critical issue. NABP applauds the sponsors of H.R. 3880 for addressing the patient-prescriber relationship and supports the language of the bill. The proposed revisions, which identify and define a qualifying medical relationship, will close a regulatory loophole exploited by rogue and illegal Internet sites. Equally as important, the proposed requirement of an in-person medical evaluation will not adversely impact the practices of telemedicine and telepharmacy. NABP also strongly supports the provisions of H.R. 3880, which allow states to bring civil action forth to enjoin the practices of illegal Internet sites and obtain nationwide injunctions against their operations. NABP's experience indicates that the operators of illegal and rogue sites are extremely knowledgeable about state and federal laws and will locate their operations to those states or areas where their activities are not specifically prohibited and may, in fact, fall within a regulatory gray area. Nationwide injunctive relief will cease these practices and allow states to work together to close regulatory loopholes and eliminate safe havens within the U.S. for illegal and rogue sites. NABP and the State Boards of Pharmacy believe that Internet service providers, advertising services, and search engines play a direct role in abetting the activities of illegal and rogue Internet sites. The inclusion of advertising on their sites from the rogue and illegal pharmacies misinforms consumers that such sites are legitimate and safe and have been qualified in some way by the ISP, the search engine, or the advertising service. Such activity is a matter of concern for the states, and at least one state is preparing a formal complaint against such entities for aiding and abetting in the violation of state and federal laws. 
NABP also requests that the legislation seek to curb the actions of illegal and rogue sites using credit card companies. NABP has been informed that information provided to the House Committee on Energy and Commerce indicates that any purchase made via a website using a credit card would allow the credit card company to locate the merchant bank and other detailed information on the seller. More importantly, the information presented to the Energy and Commerce Committee notes that the credit card companies could quickly terminate relationships with any vendors if such activities are illegal. NABP requests that the provisions of H.R. 3880, which hold harmless interactive computer services or advertising services, be reconsidered and these entities required to assume responsibility for their acceptance of funding and services from illegal and rogue sites which threaten the public health and safety. Again, we appreciate the opportunity to share our comments with the committee. We are hopeful that the proposed bill can be revised to address the concerns of the State Boards of Pharmacy, and we're anxious to work with the sponsors and committee members in achieving the stated objective of ultimately ensuring that consumers can safely use the Internet to obtain prescription medications. Thank you. Thank you very much. General Kilgore, thanks for being with us. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of attorneys generals around the nation. In the National Association of Attorneys General, I serve as the chair of the Prescription Drug Abuse Task Force. Many of us have been in Washington this week to discuss important issues facing our states. The issue of prescription drugs being sold over the Internet certainly is one of them. As we all know, the Internet offers tremendous opportunities for e-commerce, but it's also a wireless trap for fraud and scams, including the health risk involving the online sales of prescription drugs. In July of last year, we posted on our office website and issued a media alert warning individuals of the perils of online prescription drugs, including links for information on consumer safety for online prescription purposes. Thousands of Virginians rely on prescription drugs for their health. Seniors and working families struggle to afford prescription drugs. It is my role as Attorney General to ensure that consumers are protected from online fabricated pharmacies whose main concern is the bottom line, not the health of the purchaser. It is necessary to have the law enforcement tools to shut down these rogue pharmacies, and that is why I'm here today. Virginia prides itself on being a business-friendly state. As Attorney General, we often look for creative ways for the public and private sector to work together. There is a legitimate purpose for online prescription sales, but only when it is narrowly tailored to provide the convenience and cost-effective purchases following an actual visit with a physician who then prescribes the patient medication that will improve the patient's health. This legislation targets those companies whose privacy concerns and convenience at the expense of the health of the individual. It is so easy to go to one of these sites and put in information that doesn't accurately portray the health condition, such as a higher weight to allow an individual to purchase diet pills who really doesn't need those diet pills. It is also easy for a child to make up their age to purchase prescription drugs without their parents knowing. It is so easy to go to one of these sites, get a, pres get a prescription for a self-prescribed condition, something an individual may have read off another Internet site. No questionnaire can replace the diagnosis of a physician who knows the patient and understands their health history. As attorneys general, we have worked together against rogue pharmacies, but our current enforcement tools are lacking. Right now, enforcement at the state level is limited to the practice of prescribing and dispensing medication through state laws and licensure agreements. Under this legislation, as attorneys general, we need the additional enforcement authority to take these individuals to court to shut down these illegal Internet pharmacies. It is vital that the Davis-Waxman Internet Pharmacy Consumer Protection Act be adopted to protect our citizens because we believe the health care of our citizens are being jeopardized. An individual who is savvy with technology can easily start up one of these businesses and make it difficult for our law enforcement authorities to track them down. I want my computer crimes unit to have the authority to go to federal court and shut down these illegitimate businesses and get nationwide injunctions if necessary. We need Congress to give us this authority so that we can continue to protect the health of our citizens. I urge you to act favorably on this important health protection legislation for, for the constituents of each member of this committee and indeed all Americans. Thank you so much for allowing me to be with you today. 
Um, Mr. Kilgore, thank you very much for being here. Dr. Patchen. Good morning, Mr. Davis, Chairman, <clears throat> and members of the committee. I'm Rebecca Patchen. I'm a physician. I practice in Riverside, California. I'm an anesthesiologist, and I practice full-time pain management in an outpatient setting. In June of, 19, uh, June of 2003, I was elected to the AMA Board of Trustees, and we want to thank you for holding the hearing today on this important policy issue regarding the safety of internet uh, prescribing in pharmacies. The AMA appreciates the opportunity to express our views on internet pharmacies and the roles of physicians in prescribing and dispensing of medications through these pharmacies. The internet can be a valuable tool as a medical resource. And we support the use of the internet as a mechanism to prescribe and dispense medications as long as appropriate safeguards are in place. These, in these safeguards include ensuring high standards for quality medical care. And I'd like to raise three points regarding the regulation of the internet as a means of obtaining prescription medications. The first is the patient-physician relationship. The second is patient safety regarding the medications they obtain. And the third is the balance of state, federal, and private regulations. First, the AMA believes that the internet pharmacy websites or physicians that sell or dispense prescription medications without a prescription or without a valid patient-physician relationship fall well below accepted standards of high-quality medical care. They are a threat to the public health. Any internet communications between a patient and their physician should supplement and enhance, but not replace, the patient-physician relationship. The same must be true for internet transactions between a physician and the pharmacy on behalf of the patient. For physicians who prescribe via the internet, a valid patient-physician re relationship requires the following. Performing a physical examination of the patient appropriate to the nature and treatment of the problem that is presenting, taking a complete and reliable medical history, and adequate dialogue, follow-up, record-keeping, in order to inform the patients and properly assess the, the outcome to the therapeutic intervention. Exceptions to the criteria that I stated above do exist. Those would be if you're covering for a partner at a night and weekend for an existing patient, on-call situations, and ordering refills for your existing patients. But the bottom line is that safeguards must be in place to make sure that patients receive the appropriate medical medications based on their medical history and physical exams. Next, with respect to the medications obtained through the internet, patient safety is paramount. Protections need to be in place to make sure that patients get the medications they need from safe, reliable, and identifiable sources, not from the fly-by-night sites that do not meet today's safety standards. The AMA asks that physicians who practice medicine via the internet disclose identifying information on their website, including the state or states in which they are licensed. This type of disclosure requirement should also apply to the internet pharmacies. In addition, patients need a reliable way to distinguish safe and legitimate sites from those fraudulent sites or sites operating below pharmacy standards. To address this problem, the AMA will continue to work with organizations such as the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy to make legitimate sites more easily identifiable. In addition, the AMA, in conjunction with the state medical societies, will continue to urge our state medical boards to investigate and, when appropriate, to take action against physicians who fail to meet the accepted standards of medical care with regard to internet prescribing. 
We also expect that states will continue to explore various methods of regulating the manner and medium in which prescription drugs may be prescribed. Finally, on the federal level, there are currently several bills, including the chairman's, that address many of the problems we have cited here today in our written and oral testimony. While the AMA has not yet taken a position on any particular piece of legislation, we look forward to working with the members of Congress to develop appropriate legislative solutions to counter the abusive Internet practices. Together, we can protect our patients, prevent substandard and illegal Internet prescribing and dispensing of medications and mostly to ensure that the standards for high quality medical care are fulfilled. Thank you for the opportunity to express our views before this committee. I'd be happy to answer any questions later. And thank you, Dr. Patch and uh, Mr. Rector. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm particularly pleased to be here to testify on the Internet Pharmacy Consumer uh, Protection Act, which is uh, directly focused on the domestic uh, marketplace and the internet traffic in our in the United States. The National Consumer Community Pharmacists Association was founded in 1898. We represent the professional and proprietary interests of the nation's community pharmacists, including the owners of 25,000 uh, pharmacies. We are here to enthusiastically endorse uh, H.R. 3880 and commend the chair and the ranking member for the work that they have done uh, on this measure. Uh, we especially value the disclosure requirements, uh, the disclosure of the licensure of the pharmacist in the state or states where he or she uh, is licensed. We further strongly support the uh, focus on a bona fide relationship uh, with the physician and echo uh, the testimony of several other witnesses this morning in favor of the injunctive relief uh, for the attorneys uh, general to reach the extraterritorial conduct of these internet uh, businesses. I wanted to make just a few comments. Uh, whatever is done regarding importation, uh, we would think you should focus clearly and in great depth on the domestic marketplace. And basically, internet uh, is just another form of mail order pharmacy. And we'd like to take a second to put in a little bit in context our point of view on these issues. By and large, the states do not, with one exception, Arkansas, your colleague Mike Ross, when he was in the state senate there, enacted a statute, require the extraterritorial uh, pharmacies to license a pharmacist uh, in their state. Just one state does that. So it's important to focus on that. So disclosure is a step in the direction of informing the consumer so he or she has the information to know whether or not the pharmacist, if in fact they're dealing with a pharmacist, is someone licensed in their own state. And if they have that information, it might help them make the appropriate decision along with the other criteria as to whether or not they should be doing business uh, with that particular uh, site. Uh, in our attachment, we uh, highlight uh, a case brought by the United States Justice Department versus one of the major domestic uh, mail order uh, companies. And we recommend a careful review by the committee members and staff of the allegations there that have extensive implications for the subject of this hearing and related uh, issues. And I, I mention, I uh, highlight that Florida, California, Illinois, Tennessee, Texas, Michigan, Louisiana, Nevada, Virginia, Massachusetts, and D.C. are parties uh, to this whistleblower case that the Justice Department has intervened in, which really highlight the weak infrastructure currently in place regulating domestic mail order. We also think that, I've just listened carefully to the comments of the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy, and we caution the uh, committee not to take any steps uh, in the bill that is eventually reported that would have anti-competitive uh, consequences with regard to uh, various private sector initiatives to try to ferret out the rogue pharmacists and, and their allies. And lastly, we'd like to draw attention also to those that are facilitating these illegal transactions by unlicensed uh, physicians and pharmacies and pharmacists, whether it be the credit card companies or those that uh, facilitate the shipment uh, to the ultimate uh, consumer in these illegal arrangements. 
and we'd encourage the various federal agencies, and frankly, we really don't think the FDA and HHS has uh, aggressively pursued the enforcement of existing statutes. And the Justice Department can take a close look at the mail order fraud statutes, RICO, and others in trying to address the problem that you have so appropriately highlighted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Thompson, I understand you need to leave at 12. Is that uh, about to catch a plane? I'll, I'll stay as long as you need me. Okay. Uh, we've had our, we, we will not, ha not have an intervening vote. They voiced a vote with the uh, rules, so that's good. Let me start the questions. Um, let's start with you, Dr. Thompson. H.R. 3880 gives uh, State Attorney Generals federal injunctive relief against online pharmacies that are in violation of the law. Uh, what impact do you think this uh, injunctive relief will have on shutting down the rogue Internet pharmacy websites? The principal problem that we've encountered, quite frankly, is the hesitancy on a number of attorneys general and the, and the inability of them to go after these rogue sites. That's, that's only superseded by the fact that it's very difficult to locate where they are because uh, their location and change of location is as simple as, as changing a web page on a daily basis. But it would, it would significantly uh, increase an attorney general's ability to, uh, to close down pharmacies that are operating in, in not only other states but in multiple states and, after, and be able to go after uh, those rogue sites as, as well as uh, allowing us to go after the uh, physicians that are involved in this practice. Mr. Kilgore, you agree with that? I do, Mr. Chairman. It's important that state attorneys generals have this ability. And how I envision it would work, that we would join together with other attorneys generals around the nation when we identify one of these sites to, to go in and shut it down. I mean, you still have a problem identifying it, but at least now you would have a legal recourse, which you really don't now. That's right. It's, it's much the way we have to do, Mr. Chairman, with, with, with spammers under Virginia's anti-spam law, under the new one passed by, by Congress. It's difficult to identify these individuals because criminals find new ways every day to, to go out and, and make money. But we can do it. This authority, the injunctive authority, gives us greater abilities to go into federal courts and shut them down. What we continue to see is consumers going to these websites, though. I mean, what's troubling is that consumers are going to the websites because they, they think they're getting cheaper drugs or whatever. And uh, we've uh, today heard a lot of testimony on how bogus a lot of these uh, drugs are. Uh, aside from the fact that even if they were correct, they may or may not work and do what they were prescribed to do because you don't have the physician-patient relationship, um, many of these drugs are absolutely bogus. We passed some around uh, up here that uh, are routinely delivered over the Internet. Let me ask each of you, what, is, what do we do to better inform consumers of the problems in this? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think that's a, a major dilemma because we're sending mixed messages to consumers. Uh, on one hand, we're telling them it's okay to import medications from Canada, and we don't know if those sources are truly Canada. And on the other hand, we're saying they're very dangerous. We have examples of those dangerous counterfeit drugs. We've received uh, over 100 consumer complaints about medications ordered over the Internet, at least $20,000 worth of consumer fraud where they ordered medications and didn't receive those medications, and a number of complaints that the products were counterfeit or didn't have any active ingredient whatsoever. So that's a significant challenge for us, sending one message to the consumer about using the distribution system that's approved and safeguarded by the FDA and state agencies. I guess if, if anybody would, if they would counterfeit a prescription, uh, with a physician writing a prescription without it, uh, they'd certainly counterfeit the drug. I don't know why there'd be any difference on that. It uh, seems, does anybody else have any observations on that? Mr. Chairman, I would say that when tra has traveling around Virginia and speaking with senior organizations, I've picked up on the mixed messages that they are getting as well. That's why we felt it was important to weave into every presentation to senior organizations around Virginia the fact that you must be sure who you are dealing with when you are ordering prescriptions online or and reminding our seniors that Virginia law does not allow the importation and further, making it clear that you need to retain that doctor-patient uh, relationship so that they know exactly how each drug interacts with other drugs. All right. Dr. Patchen, let me ask you. You didn't specifically endorse any piece of legislation. I know your organization is careful not to do that. But do you think the provisions that we have in this legislation that Mr. Waxman and I have drafted, uh, defining an appropriate medical relationship 
uh, is consistent with AMA guidelines regarding uh, prescribing medications? Yes, they appear consistent. And on your last question, I might add, I practice in a border state, in one that the importation is not Canada, where many of our medications come in. And I view it as a patient education, something that I work with one-on-one -on -one with my patients about the safety of the medications that they may get from other areas by driving a few hundred miles. And that they, again, need to look at safety and whether the medication is really what they're getting. Uh, let me, I mean, my time's up, but let me just real quick. Does the AMA think it's important for Internet pharmacy sites to disclose physician identifying information like their licensure information on their websites? Yes. In my testimony, I stated that the physician and the pharmacy should have uh, identifying information so that the patient could contact the pharmacy as well as the physician. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Waxman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Kilgore, you testified about the importance of the provision in this bill that would give state attorneys general the ability to shut down illegitimate Internet pharmacies nationwide. Would having the power to obtain nationwide injunctions uh, encourage more enforcement by state attorneys general against these websites? And would this power be consistent with traditional state authority over the practice of medicine and pharmacy? It absolutely would encourage us to take action. The reluctance at this point, we can take action, but we, so, so under state law sometimes, but we cannot find these individuals. We we uh, we need this ability so that we can join with others, at, other attorneys generals, and, and shut these down. So what we do is provide a, a nationwide opportunity to, to deal with this problem, but not take away the prerogative of the states as they've traditionally dealt with some of these issues. That's correct. We appreciate that. Thank you. Um, Mr. Katzion, uh, the uh, you testified in strong support of the two key provisions of the bill. Uh, you endorsed the establishment of federal standards for what is a valid prescription related uh, to Internet prescribing. You've also supported giving state attorneys general the authority to shut down these sites nationwide. I'd like to ask you about two areas where you've made some suggestions for improvement in the legislation. First, you've expressed concern about how the legislation deals with Internet service providers and search engines that might sell advertisements to illegitimate pharmacies. Are you aware of efforts by Yahoo, Google, and other Internet companies to refuse <coughs> to sell advertisements to some of these Internet pharmacies? Yes, I am, sir. We, we've spoke to your, your mic's not on. Yes, I am, sir. We've spoke to those uh, search engines, and they've indicated they're interested in doing so. We're not convinced that their efforts go far enough. Uh, mm -hmm. They seem to be accepting accreditation or approval processes that don't involve a very serious inspection of those sites or a very serious uh, review of what they're doing. And in fact, they probably will be accepting advertisement from Canadian pharmacies which are operating illegally. Mm -hmm. uh, what makes this a difficult issue is that the uh, intent of the legislation is to focus on those responsible for the illegitimate s websites, not those who make the sites available to the public. I, 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 I want to look over your suggestions. I think it's uh, one that we need to carefully consider, and I appreciate the, that thought behind it. You've also made the suggestion that Internet pharmacies should participate in a formal disclosure and verification program, such as the VIPS program, which is run by the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy. You suggested that one benefit of such an approach might be better enforcement. Are you suggesting that participating in VIPS or an equivalent program be required of all Internet pharmacies? Hi, Mr. Waxman, we've talked about this issue with uh, a v variety of groups, and yes, we're recommending some mandatory program. Voluntary program isn't going far enough, and the sites will do anything they can to confuse consumers and to hide information. So simply requiring the posting of information that will probably be fraudulent in many cases won't help the consumers. How many participating Internet pharmacies does VIPS certify now? We currently have 13 sites representing eight to 10,000 pharmacies in the United States. And if all the Internet pharmacies were required to participate in VIPS, how many do you think uh, might apply? Now, they estimate that the Internet pharmacy market is anywhere between 8 and 22 percent of existing pharmacies. There are probably right now 75,000 pharmacies licensed in the United States. So that number would be 8 to 10 percent of that, uh, upwards to 7,500 pharmacies. Mm -hmm. I appreciate the advantages of the VIPS program. It's a model we believe the Secretary should look at when considering how to implement this bill. However, regulating a few large Internet pharmacies is not the same as monitoring what could be hundreds of thousands of Internet pharmacies. 
this is an enforcement challenge for anyone, whether FIPS or FDA or the state's attorney general. Uh, we'll re review this suggestion carefully. I think it's uh, one that's, uh, I'm pleased you drew, uh, brought to our attention. Uh, Dr. Payton, uh, you, your testimony covered a wide variety of topics, but I want to ask you about a couple of specifics. You testified that current AMA policy requires physicians who prescribe via the Internet to clearly disclose physician identifying information on the website. Are you aware that H.R. 3880 includes this requirement as well as the requirement that uh, pharmacies also be identified? And would you agree that the disclosure provisions in this bill are consistent with AMA policy? At this time, yes. Okay, good. And um, you testify that AMA policy prohibits prescribing medications without a valid doctor-patient relationship. This includes performing a physical examination adequate to establish the diagnosis, having sufficient dialogue with the patient regarding risks, and maintaining a medical record that's readily available to the patient. In your judgment, as a doctor who churns out prescription after prescription on the basis of little or no information through an arrangement with an Internet pharmacy in compliance with AMA policy, and uh, are you aware that this bill prohibits Internet pharmacies from arranging for doctors to write prescriptions for consumers without ever seeing them? The physician who writes a prescription without the patient-physician relationship, as we described, would be in violation of AMA policy, correct? And you think this is a good provision for that, yes. uh, accomplishing that goal? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Carter, any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when we're dealing with uh, lawsuits in the United States, uh, the plaintiff's bar will argue that a lot of, the, a lot of what they do in, as taking actions in the plaintiff's bar is policing up organizations that don't police themselves uh, and targeted uh, is the AMA, that the doctors don't police up their malpractice. Now, what I've heard testimony here today is that, that uh, you, you would sanction. I would like to know exactly, if you were to identify a doctor who was operating this illegal pr procedure, uh, what sanctions would you take against that doctor? Would you punch his ticket and stop him from practicing medicine? Uh, yes, sir. The Federation of State Medical Boards is, is the membership association of the nation's 70 licensing and territorial uh, regulatory authorities. And a number of licenses have been revoked, and there have been uh, disciplinary actions taken against a number of physicians that have been involved in, in this kind of activity. Uh, it can be anything from a slap on the hand to a license revocation, but uh, the, the kind of activity that we've seen more often than not leads to revocation of a license. Difficult, however, to, to track these physicians down and very difficult to, uh, to, to work across state lines in, in this kind of activity. And I understand that we're giving tools to the, to the attorneys general across the, across the state to, to, to try to help do this, but part of the ultimate solution has got to be those people who are, who are violating standards, violating laws, and threatening lives have to be taken out of the system. If they're not taken out of the system, they're going to figure out another crooked way to do this thing. The, the most notorious of the individuals who, is, uh, who deals with uh, Internet prescriptions uh, had a license in 26 different states, and to date has had 14 of those removed, and by uh, reciprocal action through, uh, through the information services that we provide through the Federation is uh, soon on his way to having all of his licenses revoked. And the, and the same question I would, I would direct to the, the, those people involved in pharmacy. Would, the, would the, the pharmacies also punch the ticket on people who are writing these, uh, who are doing this, what I consider, illegal op operation? Yes, sir. Right. That's all the questions I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Mr. Towns? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me begin with you, uh, Dr. Patchen. Uh, you use the term safeguards must be in place on two occasions. What do you mean by safeguards must be in place? Safeguards regarding the uh, Internet prescribing would be to ensure that the, there is a s approved supply of drugs that are the right dose, the right drug for the right patient with the right appropriate dosing interval and right time. Escape safeguards for prescribing would include 
the state laws that govern the practice of medicine as well as the uh, prescribing and the community standard. All right. Thank you. It, um, my concern, and I guess this uh, to the Attorney General on this one, um, you know, um, this legislation is dealing with domestic uh, websites. You know, um, it doesn't do anything with international websites. And I'm sort of concerned about the fact that uh, once the noose is tightened, that might have a problem in terms of people going out of, uh, of the country and doing almost the same thing. So uh, what do we do here? I mean, I'm concerned. Uh, I'm in favor you know, of shutting down all internet pharmacy sites. However, it appears that better oversight and controls are needed. It's, but in purchasing drugs through internet can offer you know, uh, I, uh, incredible, I mean, no question about it, uh, benefits for homebound patients. And of course, patients that might have a, a disease of some sort that they might not want the world to know. I mean, I think that uh, uh, there's benefits there as well. But I am concerned, so I'd like to hear your comments about, you know, once we tighten the news as to what we might run into. And that, that very well could happen. This is a great first step to, to control the domestic Internet companies. It's a great first step to give state attorneys generals the ability to enforce the act. We recognize that as we go, go about enforcing the act that uh, as we shut down internet, internet uh, pharmacies, that we could see the effect you are talking about. I, they move overseas, they, they, they uh, go international. Then we will have to address that through, through our relationship with the FDA and work with the FDA and DEA on those important issues. All right, thank you. Uh, I guess this is for the doctors on the panel. Um, in your experience, do healthcare professionals typically inquire about where a patient obtained his or her prescription drug before making changes or switching to an alternative product? Is that question generally asked, you know, where you get your medication from or yes. you ask the doctors first? Yes. Uh, part of the assessment and obtaining the history and physical would be in the history to find out what medications they're taking and who is prescribing them and you will find out where they're filling them. Many times I find out even the name of the pharmacy or the uh, provider that they're getting their medications dispensed from. Uh, yes. uh, Dr. Patchen is an anesthesiologist who deals in, in pain management, so she's more likely dealing with the type of drugs that we're talking about. I'm an ear, nose, and throat doctor, and I infrequently deal with, uh, with heavy narcotics, and so in, in my practice, I would not necessarily have known where someone uh, uh, filled their prescription. I, I would, however, know what drugs they have been taking and for what reason they've been taking them. Mr. Cassioni, I want to hear you on this. <laughs> Yeah, that's a very critical question, and we're trying to work with uh, the physician groups to ask patients that question, because if their blood pressure is uncontrollable or their diabetes worsens, the assumption made is that the medication's not working, so they increase the dose or change the medication when it could be a counterfeit product or a product that has no active ingredient. So we would also ask that that be a consideration of, of any of these discussions, and we're going to ask the FDA to change their MedWatch form to allow for that information to be asked so that they can identify whether it came from outside of the U.S. distribution system. Let me just sort of say, Mr. Chairman, you know, I think this legislation uh, is good, you know, but, uh, you know, the question in my mind, does it go far enough? And I would just like to just have an extra second or two just to run down the line to ask sure. each member in terms of what they might we want to add to make it better. Well, I First of all, let me say that for the purposes of addressing the problem that, uh, that this committee has been confronted with, this legislation is, is excellent. And I, I would applaud uh, the chair and, and, the, uh, the, and the other leaders of, of this committee for, for, I think, superb legislation that will deal with the issue. We'll take there as are, much time as you need uh, if you're on that. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are... Uh, there, there are a number of other issues, however, that relate to the technology. And, and we in this nation have 
uh, have seen a situation in which the technology has far superseded our ability to deal with the ethics or the regulation of that technology. And, and quite frankly, we're playing catch up. This is a giant leap forward, I believe, for the citizens in this country. Uh, there remains much work left to be done, however. Echo Dr. Thompson's compliments on the, on the bill, absent the fact that we believe the disclosure should be mandatory, should be verified. In regard to the, the patient and the question of where the medication should be obtained from, that may not be a matter for legislation. That's a matter for the Federation and the American Medical Association to work together and increase the, that as a standard of care for patients as part of the diagnosis differential. I totally support this legislation. It's a great move forward, a great move to protect patients' rights in the future, and it gives certainly attorneys generals around the nation the ability to protect, to protect our consumers. The one issue I think we must deal with in the future is to deal with the importation issues so that we avoid sending mixed messages to our seniors and others in our states about whether they sh should be able to import drugs from foreign countries. We need to, if we allow that, we need to make sure those drugs are safe, those, those drugs are accurate, and they, we continue to require a physician-patient relationship. I would like to uh, make a plea for the patient safety, and the patient safety is ensuring that they're getting the right drug in the right concentration, in the right vehicle, in the right timing as part of the patient-physician relationship in that prescribing. We strongly uh, endorse the legislation, each of its key uh, provisions. We think it's carefully drawn to avoid any anti-competitive consequences by endorsing one private sector certification program over another. But a related subject, not necessarily for this committee, but perhaps, would be to carefully review the statutes that are available to prosecute those entities uh, that are facilitating the illegal commerce, both foreign and domestic. That means the, uh, the shippers and the credit card companies and others. If, if the subject was stolen property, there'd be no question. This is a lot more serious, typically, than stolen property. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I don't have anything to yield back, so I just stop. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. I just want to ask a couple follow-up questions. <clears throat> Mr. Rector, um, you stated in your testimony that the regulation of the practice of pharmacy by pharmacists rests exclusively with the respective states. I just want you to reiterate again for the record uh, the need for H.R. 3880 as a federal law when you already have the state regulation from your perspective as a pharmacist. We think that the 3880 ideally complements the uh, jurisdiction that the states uh, enjoy both over the practice of medicine and the practice of pharmacy. <coughs> and um, I mean, the world has basically changed with the Internet. Isn't that what's Absolutely. happened here? And everybody Absolutely. agrees with that, that the old rules don't apply when you have such an ubiquitous uh, uh, communications device as, as the Internet. And so, Absolutely. And certainly, uh, Mr. Kilgore, from an enforcement point of view, it changes everything. You, you noted it's hard to find these people. And in many cases, you, you really want to join with other attorney generals to shut them down because you're chasing them all over the globe. Is that basically? That's true. The Internet's become the Wild West, if you will, and we need this added ability in, the, in our enforcement tools to, to go after these rogue pharmacies. Well, let me ask you this. Your experience on spammers, I know that you've brought one of the first cases in the country uh, prosecuting uh, spamming and so on. How is that going? And how, uh, you used your state tool there. You have one of the strongest state laws, I know, which uh, uh, you and Senator Stolle and, and Senator Devilites helped write. H how has that helped, and what's your experience on that tell you about this? It, it, again, it, it confirms our, our fear in the state that these cases take a lot of time, a lot of energy in our office to investigate and track down these individuals that are committing crimes. We have charts and charts that fill up a room where we've traced the ISPs from their, from gone to the ISP to get their address to only to find out they're operating under, in many different domains. And it's, it's, uh, it just takes a lot of time my, my computer crimes unit, but we continue to investigate just like we will once we are given this authority under this legislation, investigate and shut down the agencies. 
as I understand it, today you could, if some, if someone is uh, selling uh, Lipitor and it's not Lipitor, or they're selling Viagra and it's not Viagra, you could prosecute them for that if you can run them down. Is that right? That is correct. But this gives you the additional tool because they're doing it without a prescription, and that's probably even easier to prove. Is that probably much easier? I mean, everybody understand that's well, this is just an additional tool in trying to get some of these folks. In addition to that, uh, without the appropriate uh, uh, medical authorization, uh, people are at risk. All right. Um, will the new disclosure standards also ought to help identify the offending website, shouldn't it? I mean, we, we talked about the yes. pharmacies and the doctors talking about where you get it. Wouldn't that help disclose the offending websites as well? I, I would think it would. Uh, we think it's a first step. We think it's, it's not going to address the issue entirely, though. Okay. Well, thank you very much. This has been very helpful to us. Uh, we'd like to do something about that, and having uh, the support and the testimony from your organizations is very critical uh, in this. Uh, again, I want to thank all the witnesses for taking their time to testify today. And uh, hearings closed. Thank you. Don't watch C-SPAN. Boy, you're missing the whole, you're missing the world going by, really. They get right to the point. They give you the, the, the information that you need. You want to get to the heart of a problem or a bill that's going through the house, or you want to get to the heart of what an author has said 